In this video, I will explain all the specs and features of all six generations of Camaro. I have made an insanely detailed page for each generation. Nothing like this has ever been created before. I list tons of specs and all engines and horsepower ratings for each generation, plus see how 0 to 60 and quarter mile times compared. I'll also tell you which year of Camaro sold the most, and it's not the 69. I'll even show you on a map where each generation was made, and there was one movie that caused Camaro sales to spike way up. Do you know what it was? For each generation, I'm also going to explain what I think are the three coolest features, plus much, much more. Let's go. Most know the 67 Camaro was Chevy's answer to Ford's hugely popular 64 Mustang, but you may not know that the Camaro was kind of a rush job and shared the front subframe and semi-unibody platform with the 68 Chevy Nova, just like the first Mustang used the Ford Falcon chassis. I'll skip the dimensions because I have a size comparison page at the end so you can see which Camaro is the lowest, longest, and lightest. 15 exterior colors were offered and 8 interior. As you'll see going through the next six generations, that's way more than what more recent generations offered. Engine and performance. As was pretty common in the 60s, there were tons of engine choices. Two inline sixes, four small blocks, and two big blocks, and a few super rare specialty engines. And engines back then didn't rev much, especially that old inline six which had debuted in 1962. Performance numbers seen here are for a 67 SS model. It's a 350 with 295 horse, a pretty typical performance model of the day. The Z28 was about a second quicker than this. The skid pad G-Force listed here is the exact same as a modern Honda minivan, with much of that having to do with the much lower tire technology in the 1960s. A new Toyota Prius can stop from 60 in 33 less feet than the 67 Camaro. I'll have links to Car and Driver and Motor Trend original road tests in the description if you want to read them. On to transmissions. A two-speed automatic was offered. My 68 Camaro actually had originally a two-speed power glide when I bought it. A three-speed manual was the standard trans. The others listed were optional. In 1967, every Camaro had 14-inch wheels except the Z28. As you'll see with the next couple generations of Camaro, 14 and 15 inch wheels will be the main wheel choice for many years. Let's keep going. A solid axle and rear leaf springs. This is 120 year old farm wagon suspension technology. But this was of course fairly common on cars in the 60s and 70s. Four wheel, non-power drum brakes were standard. They sucked. I had this in my Camaro for a brief time. Scary stuff. Power brakes and front discs were optional. Prices. Here you can see original prices and today's prices. Yep, horrible first-gen cars sell for $15,000 today. It's nuts. They made a lot of these, but demand is so high that rusted out hollow shells still sell. For each generation, I will show you what I think are the three coolest, quirkiest, or most unique features. Number one, padded dash. This was actually a safety feature. Padded dash and padded sun visors too. You gotta love the 60s. Here is basically what it says in the brochure. Look, we know with only lap seat belts and no headrests that your face is going to smash into the dash during an accident. So we've padded it. Number two, flush and dry rocker panels. Rust was such a huge problem on older cars. In theory, this uses water and air from the cowl to flush the area clean all the way down into the rocker panels, reducing the chance of rust. But these tended to collect leaves inside them, which trapped moisture and made it worse. Either way, they still rusted out. Number three, a stereo tape music system known as 8-track. Eight 8-track eight home players were only really introduced in 1966, so to have one in the car in 1968 was amazing. They were praised for their portability and affordability compared to vinyl albums at the time. Imagine, kids, up to 80 minutes of uninterrupted music. The 8-track was king in the 60s, but by the late 70s, it was dead, replaced by the compact cassette. By 1983, you couldn't even find 8-track in the stores anymore. Let's move on to sales. So 700,000 first-gen Camaros were built. 69 is the most popular year, but the second gen was delayed due to a strike at GM, so the 69 sold for more months. So in per-month sales, the 68 was actually the best seller. Rare models. As you can see, the RS was the most popular option trim, followed by the SS at 14%. Like I've said before, of the 97,000 SS first-gen Camaros built, only 150,000 are still on the road. Just a quick note on the first-gen differences. Here are the basics. 67 had the window wings. 68 got the government-required side marker lights so other drivers don't T-bone you at night. And 69 has the squared-off fender tops with trailing crease in the body line. All three had different grille and taillights and minor stainless and chrome trim differences. 
As mentioned, the first-gen Camaro design was highly compromised by the fact that it shared a chassis with the family sedan. Second-gen designers were determined to have an all-new fresh design that was not influenced by family car proportions. The second gen was totally new, with almost no design elements carrying over from the original first gen. The main focus was a low cowl design. That's the area right in front of the windshield. They wanted to proportion it to look dramatically lower, longer, and sleeker with a what they called slipstream fastback-like roofline. The original designers have stated it was designed to look more European. The second gen was bigger in every dimension, including weight, except it was an inch or two lower than the first gen. Second gen horsepower peaked in 1970 with 375 gross horsepower from the 396. But by 1975, the most powerful V8 offered was only 155 net horsepower. Big block engines were discontinued with 1972 being the last year. Small blocks were detuned and choked down to try to gain a few MPGs due to the 1973-74 gas crisis. As you would expect, performance numbers were not great. They actually went backwards from the first gen. The two-speed Powerglide transmission was discontinued for model year 1973. In 1981, transmissions were equipped with lockup torque converters. As mentioned, wheel sizes were mostly the same as the first gen. Suspension was also mostly the same, but with somewhat improved geometry. All Camaros had front disc and rear drum standard, and this didn't change throughout the whole life cycle. Power brakes became standard in 1976. Rear discs were never offered as an option for Gen 2. Today, prices for Gen 2s are a bit less than the first gen, especially for late 70s and early 80s models. Okay, the three cool features. The coolest feature has to be the T-top, offered first in 1978, even though the VET had it standard since 1968. In 1978, only four percent of Camaros had T-top. In many ways to me, the T-top signaled peak Camaro. Number two, 1979 saw the addition of rear window defogger in the electric glass. This was high tech at the time. Remember that in the 60s, very few cars even had defogger fans. 1978 was the first year for alloy wheels, known at the time as mag wheels, as some were made for magnesium. Still, the largest wheel sizes were only 15 by 7 and only on the Z28. The second generation was Camaro's longest and its most successful. Due to to the low horsepower numbers at the time, a lot of engineering and marketing emphasis was put on handling and this was mostly successful. In 1977, the Camaro outsold the Mustang for the first time. The 1977 Camaro Z28 helped. After a two-year absence, the Z28 returned as a suspension and decal package. But the 1977 Camaro also had big help from the Smokey and the Bandit movie, which released in May of 77. Of course, that was a Trans Am, but it clearly helped Camaro sales. Peak sales occurred two years later in 1979, with 282,000 being sold, the most ever. Rare models include the 1970 396 big block cars. The second generation is usually divided into three distinct periods, each of four years in length. The chrome bumper period was carryover from the 1960 design. The aluminum bumper period was mostly due to government regulations calling for minimum body damage during a two and a half mile per hour crash. Notice it now has a sloping front end too. These changes added seven inches to the car's overall length. The rear window was also changed during this period in 1975 to a wraparound style to help with rear blind spots. In 1978, the aluminum bumpers were replaced with a urethane rubber front and rear bumper with impact crash bars hidden behind them. The new look was complemented with T-tops, low front spoilers, high rear spoilers, and fender vents. Also, by 1980, almost 40% of Camaros were purchased by women. The days of selling macho, high horsepower engines to men were long over. Gen 3 was an all-new architecture and the only Camaro with a hatchback, which was popular with imports at the time. Front-end design was said to be inspired by slant-nosed Porsche race cars. Still, this is the car most associated with 80s mullets and big hair. The car was initially offered in hardtop and T-top body styles. The 1982 Z28 was the first American production car to incorporate ground effects. Build quality in the 80s was suspect for all Detroit cars, and the Camaro is no exception. If you want to restore one of these, and you should, be prepared for lots of cheap plastic and cracked vinyl. The third gen was lighter than the second by 500 pounds, shorter by 10 inches, and had a 7 inch shorter wheelbase. Potential here for a good performance build. At launch, the Camaro's base engine was a 2.5 liter Iron Duke 4 cylinder with 90 horsepower. This engine was also installed in mail trucks. The top engine was not much better. A fuel injected 5 liter V8 making 165 horsepower. 0 to 60 time was almost 10 seconds. The 4 cylinder was almost 20 seconds 0 to 60. 
But by the end of 1992, zero to 60 times were in the low sixes and Camaros were pulling 0.9G on the skid pad. In 1983, a new Borg Warner T5 five-speed manual transmission was standard, replacing the four-speed unit. But the five-speed manual could not handle the torque of the top V8 and so was never offered on the IROC. The same year, 1983 saw a new four-speed automatic transmission as well. We're still using 14 and 15 inch wheels mostly, just like in the 60s, but we do see the introduction of 16s on the 1985 IROC. The car had new McPherson strut type front suspension and the rear suspension was also improved with coil springs instead of old school leaf springs and longitudinal torque tubes, short control arms ahead of the solid axle and a lateral track rod to control sideways movement. You can find pretty cheap trashed cars today from this era that could be a good starting point for a build. Interestingly too, IROCs from this era sell for almost double what Corvettes from this era sell for. The three coolest features. Number one is the 1984 to 86 Berlinetta Dash. It's just so spaceshipy. I really want a bone stock Berlinetta T-top with this dash and the swivel stereo. Is that strange? Number two, the Z28 red custom interior option. This has got to be the most Camaro thing I've ever seen. I actually love this. And number three, 1989 was the first year for rear shoulder belts. 1.5 million third gen Camaros were sold, more than all generations except the Gen 2. Initially, the simply named Sport Coupe was the base model. Above the Sport Coupe was the Berlinetta, which had been around since 79. It was targeted more to women and luxury buyers. It was way ahead of its time and had a more plush interior, all digital dash, a stock mounted AM FM cassette player, which could move towards the driver or the passenger, toned down exterior styling and a softer suspension. Berlinetta was briefly replaced by the LT and then after being a California only experiment model, the RS was added in 1989 as the base model. The International Race of Champions IROC Z launched with the Camaro in 1985. The International Race of Champions series pitted drivers from different racing leagues in identically prepared Camaro race cars. IROC was initially available as a performance and a periods package on the Z28 before becoming its own triv level in 1998. But in 1991, GM lost the rights to the IROC Racing Series and the IROC Z became the Z28 again. In 1988, the 1LE was offered. It looked like a regular Z28, but was designed for hardcore racers. It came without air conditioning and added big Corvette brakes, aluminum drive shafts, special shocks, and fuel tank baffling. 1LE volume was super low, as you can see. The convertible was only offered in 1987, the first since 1969, and it had its best year in 1990 when it was 15% of all Camaro sales. Why did the convertible sales spike up in 1990? I'll give you a second. Think about what car came out in 1990 that was mega popular. The Mazda Miata. I know you may be thinking the Miata sucks, but back in 1990 it caused a media sensation. Buyers were paying way over sticker and Mazda could not keep up with demand. Convertible sports cars started selling like crazy. And well, if the Mazda Miata was too small for you, then the Camaro made a great alternative. But unfortunately, all Camaro convertible models were converted from production T-tops by ASC International. These were pretty rickety cars, as is usually the case when a car that was never intended to be a convertible gets cut open and made into a convertible. I love convertibles, but this is likely one you don't want. Stick to the coupe. The new 4th gen Camaro was built on a heavily revised version of the 3rd gen's chassis, including a new rack and pinion steering system with vastly superior handling and feel. In 1993, Camaro launched with two trims, Base Coupe and Z28. And this car was big, more on that later. Using GM's new Gen 2 LT1, first seen on the 92 Corvette, this is the most significant update to the small block V8 since its introduction in 1955, and I've got a video on this. In the Camaro, it made 275 horsepower, a 30 horsepower increase compared to the outgoing car. In 1996, the Camaro Z28 SS made its return. Converted by SLP, Street Legal Performance, through an agreement with Chevrolet, it had a hood scoop, taller rear spoiler, ZR1 style wheels, and 310 horsepower. In 1998, the Camaro SS got the all-new Gen 3 LS1. We've talked a little bit about the LS engine on this channel. It was rated at 320 horsepower in the SS, and Camaros were now hitting 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds. Gen 5 saw the first six-speed manual for Camaro. It was available at launch. 11 years after the IROC got 16-inch wheels, the 1996-optioned SS package got 17 by 9-inch wheels with 275 40ZR tires. Man, wheel sizes took forever 
forever to evolve. The fourth gen had a sophisticated double wishbone high A-arm front suspension as well. This was done instead of an independent rear. Supposedly, GM accountants said only one could be afforded. ABS was standard, reducing 60 to zero braking distances by 30 feet. Anyone looking for a cheap build, used fourth gens are the most affordable. Okay, three cool features. Driver's side airbag was offered in 1990. 1995 saw the introduction of traction control, a $450 option on the Z28. In 1998, the T56 six-speed got computer-aided gear selection, known as skip shift. Under light throttle conditions, the computer would force an upshift from first to fourth gear to improve fuel consumption. Okay, not a cool feature, more of a notorious feature. Still, it was easily disabled. There was also a minor change update for 1998. The biggest difference for the redesign was the headlights and grille. The 98 model quickly earned the nickname Catfish due to its headlight design and grille opening, which to some resembled the eyes and mouth of a catfish. The 98 to 02 models did not sell well despite getting the new LS engine. The fourth gen sold less than Gen 1 through 3, but more than Gen 5 and 6. Overall, the fourth gen Camaro was met with mixed reviews. Sales were okay at first, but quickly declined. When crash standards increased in the late 90s requiring an update to the car, there was no desire at GM to spend the money and the Camaro was killed. In August 2002, its 35th anniversary year, Chevrolet ended production of the Camaro, but really we killed it by buying trucks and SUVs instead of fun to drive cars. And that trend continues today. So for six model years, we had no Camaro. What did GM give us instead? We got the Chevrolet SSR, a horribly slow, bloated, trailblazer-based, convertible SUV type thing. I guess intended for midlife crisis boomers? It had a 5.3 liter V8 with 300 horsepower, but it had to move 4,000 pounds of truck and with only a four-speed automatic transmission. At launch, it did zero to 60 in 7.7 seconds. It sold horribly. In four years, 24,000 SSRs were made total. That's a little more than half of what the fourth gen Camaro sold in its final and worst selling year. The SSR was dead within four years, GM killed it. GM execs will probably tell you it was a branding model, but how is that? No sales, no performance, and only old people buying them. How does that improve branding? Anyway, we eventually got the fifth gen Camaro, trying to catch up to the Mustang again, except this time it was the 2005 Mustang, and it took GM five years to catch up instead of three like in 1967. Wheelbase grew almost a foot versus the gen four Camaro, but overall length shrunk by three inches. Height grew by three inches, and width also grew by two inches. Weight though ballooned up 500 pounds, that's 225 kilograms. For me, that was the biggest weak point of the fifth gen Camaro, the other one being the outward visibility. This car weighs as much as a mid-70s square body truck, so please don't ever call it a sports car. Still, the chassis was amazing, miles ahead of any Camaro before it. The SS manual Camaro models offered a 6.2 liter LS3 small block rated at 426 horsepower. From Gen 4, the V8 is up 101 horsepower and the V6 is up 123 horsepower. 2012 saw the first supercharger in a Camaro. The ZL1 had the LSA engine. It's the fastest Camaro ever, zero to 60 in 3.8 seconds, quarter mile in 12.1 at 117 with a top speed of 184. But my favorite modern Camaro though is the 2014 Z28 with the 505 horsepower seven liter Z06 engine. Man, I sure was hoping GM would have given us a six gen Z28. All six-speed transmissions all the time, and that's no bad thing in the 2010s. The 14, 15, 16, and 17-inch wheels are now a distant memory, with the fifth gen sporting some serious tires too. Finally, the Camaro gets an independent rear suspension, and the car is so much better for it. And Corvette had IRS since 1963. Used V8s with low miles are still pretty expensive. All right, let's talk about the three cool features. Number one, four-piston Brembo brakes on the SS models and up. Number two, performance traction management. GM engineers called it flying car logic. It helps maintain the car's full power and momentum even if the tires briefly lose contact with the road in track conditions. Without it, the traction control system would reduce power and apply brakes. The best part though is it has five levels of slip. So you can drive like a maniac on the track, but still have the hand of God protecting you. And when I say hand of God, I mean GM's traction logic. Number three, lightweight 19 inch forged aluminum wheels. These reduced unsprung weight by 48 pounds compared to the 20-inch wheels standard on the Camaro SS and ZL1. 
Half a million fifth gens were sold in six years. There is no doubt the sixth gen is the best performing Camaro. The chassis is world class. And while it's lighter than the fifth gen, it's still pretty heavy. When it comes to engines and performance, we have only good news here too. 335 horsepower V6, 455 horsepower V8, and a 650 horsepower supercharged V8. Great news with transmissions too. Super modern world-class drivelines are now the norm at GM. Wheels and tires for every need, modern and powerful brakes and killer suspensions, no compromises here. A brand new 2024 SS Coupe starts at 45,000. Up next, cool features. Number one, 10 speed automatic transmissions. It has a super low first gear for amazing off the line acceleration and super tall freeway gears for quiet cruising and great miles per gallon. Number two, rear cross traffic alert. This takes the backup camera to the next level. Sensors in the rear of the car can warn you if a car is coming from the side while backing up, like out of a crowded parking space, for example. And number three, finally, the ZL1 1LE Multimatic DSSV Spool Valve Dampers. They have an amazing adjustability and have a range of function beyond any shim-based damper. Sales were pretty poor. The 6th gen Camaro was outsold by its competitors, the Mustang and the Dodge Challenger from 2016 to 2024. Sad too, because the Camaro was by far the best performer of the three, certainly the best chassis, usually winning head-to-head -head competitions. But the styling was too similar to the 5th gen and even a bit goofy at times and the bathtub-like seating position with its poor outward visibility continued to be a problem. Rare models. The 2018 ZL1 is a beast, but this time Chevy added 1LE handling too. 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, 60 to 0 in 91 feet, 1.11 Gs on the skid pad. It's a $75,000 supercar killer. At the time, Motor Trend called it the most track-capable road car GM has ever sold. Just for fun, I added this cool list of Indy Pace cars. For the first three generations, the Camaro was made in Los Angeles, California, and Cincinnati, Ohio. Gen 4 moved to Montreal, Quebec, the most French of all the Canadian provinces. The fifth gen moved down the road a bit, still Canadian, but this time near Toronto, Ontario. For the sixth gen, the Camaro production moved back to the U.S., this time in Lansing, Michigan. The Camaro was also made in super low volume in a few other countries, mostly for Gen 1 and Gen 2. Here is a size comparison. To hopefully make it easier to quickly understand, I'm comparing the 67 versus all the other generations. Blue means bigger than the 67, red means less than the 67. Let's start with Gen 1. These specs are for a 67, but remember that the 69 is a couple inches wider and a couple inches longer than the 67 and 68. Gen 2 is long, wide, and low, and paid a price in weight. Gen 3 is long, low, and super light. Gen 4 is just long, 9 inches longer than the 67 with a super short wheelbase. That could be why it just does not look right to some people. Gen 5 is kind of a fat pig. Gen 6 may be the sweet spot, just a bit bigger and heavier but with modern engine chassis and technology. It's almost the same size as the 69. So this video has been my love letter to the Camaro. I'm not some crazy Camaro fanboy, just a dude who bought a 68 Camaro when he was 15 and still has it and works on it. Thought it would be fun to do a video on the history of the Camaro. Nothing like this has ever really been done before. If you'd like to see me do other models, let me know in the comments. I want to let you know that I'm working on an LS Swap Survival Guide ebook, which is now free to pre-order on my website, but once it's finished it will not be free, so pre-order now. 11 reasons to order the ebook. 1. It's already over 120 pages and I'm adding pages all the time. 2. It has help with choosing everything, new versus used, car versus truck engine, iron block versus aluminum, displacements, cylinder heads, intakes, and so much more. 3. You'll save money too as I explain which parts are worth replacing or upgrading. Don't buy parts you don't need. Too many swappers make this expensive mistake. One of my goals was to have this ebook solve any problem, not just major ones, but little things like tiny sensors, gaskets, relays, everything you need for a swap has a dedicated page in my ebook. This way you don't need to spend days searching dozens of websites and videos for a solution. Complicated topics are made simple. Wiring, sensors, fuel regulators, injectors, tuning, electrical harnesses, and more. If you've seen my videos, you know I have an amazing ability to simplify complex topics. I also have a list of 21 potential problem areas to look out for. Some are easy repairs you should absolutely do before you install the engine. Others are just things to look out for. I'm a firm believer that you need to do your research before starting an expensive project. I've done this research. This will save you money as you won't need to buy the wrong parts or do the wrong things. 
Once downloaded, you can save the ebook on your phone, home computer, or tablet. Once you buy it, you own it. Email it to a friend, no problem. Split the cost with three friends, no problem. And unlike a paperback book that you buy and never gets improved, this ebook will be regularly updated. But the best part is, those future updates are all free, always free. And they are updates for life. No need to resubmit an order or contact Auto Guild or repay ever. We just email the update to you as soon as it's completed. This, of course, is the one big benefit of buying your own copy. When finished, I will have put over 1,000 hours of research into this book. Pre-order now at autoguild.com. A link is also down in the description below. Another thing, I have a free LS cylinder head ebook for you. It breaks down all 20 LS cylinder heads into eight simple groups. It's now available and ready to be downloaded. I have posters on the website too. A history of the LS engine, poster version of my first video, every LS engine ever. I also have a choose your own path poster where you answer funny questions and the poster picks the best type of muscle car for you. And three, I have a poster of my LS cylinder head video and ebook for your shop or garage. All three of these posters were handmade by me. You will likely have the only one in your city. They make a great conversation piece for your garage or shop. If you want to see the difference between the LS engine, which is in the 4th and 5th gen Camaro, and the LT engine, which is in the 6th gen Camaro, check out the video on top. If you want to see how the 6th gen LT engine compares to the Mustang's Coyote engine, then check out the video on the bottom. And please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching Auto Guild, and good luck with your project.